Good morning. Welcome to Wesley Church this morning on this Palm Sunday. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Could we stand and worship Jesus together?
our prayers of our hearts as we come. Just lift Hosanna to him one more time. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Father, may you hear our songs, our worship this morning. May it bring a smile to your face as we sing. We pray this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Can we share in this responsive reading this morning? Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. You are God, and we will praise you. You are God, and we will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
Amen. Could you just pray one more time with me? Heavenly Father, we just pray for Pastor Blake as he would come to share your word this morning. Father, may the words that you've laid on his heart reach us in a new way today. May you open our hearts, our minds. May you take, may you take down any barriers that are blocking us from seeing your full face this morning. Jesus, we pray this in your mighty and powerful name. Amen. You may be seated. today. If you'd like to have a note guide today, they're available to you. Rich and Mike have them, as is our custom. I also would like to share a number of ministry notes with you, particularly about Holy Week and what we're going to experience in the next few days. Uh, and starting with tomorrow evening, it's the fifth Monday. Uh, on the fifth Monday, our leadership team has determined it will have a, uh, and, and decided upon the leading of the Holy Spirit to have a worship service um, in particular, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, a night of expressive worship and prayer. And it won't be like this here, but, and, and, but it'll be a blessing to you, I believe. We're going to clear some chairs over here. There's going to be some uh, worshipful dance. In fact, there's going to be a, a, a practice or a walkthrough or a learning about that here at the end of our service. And so if you would like to be part of that, we invite you to, do, uh, to stay for the dance portion of that. And then tomorrow night, that expressive worship uh, will be taking place here at 7 o'clock. We invite you to come and be part of that. Then on Thursday night, we have Monday, Thursday communion service. Nathaniel Lacey, our uh, youth children's and uh, our youth director, excuse me, he will be speaking that night, and that's at 7 o'clock, and we'll share in communion as well. And then on Friday night, Good Friday, uh, 7 o'clock, we'll have our communion service again on Good Friday with Patrick Buck, uh, Buckner, who is our worship uh, leader down at Coleraine Church. Um, he will be here to share and to speak that night. And then, of course, next Sunday, we have our Easter services. Following Easter, we have uh, a, a series that's coming at Pastor Rich Stevenson. It's a book that he wrote, and also the 40 Days of Easter. Pastor, why don't you just, why don't you stand and tell? I don't know why. I, I don't need to tell it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know why I was going to make your announcement. I mean, that's... <laughs> so those are the ministry notes. And then, of course, your bulletin is just filled with all kinds of things that we're, uh, uh, that we're having uh, take place out of Wesley Church. This morning, of course, it's Palm Sunday. We're going to look at a Palm Sunday message uh, that, that we look at the, the progression as he walks through, as he comes through into Jerusalem, Jesus, that being Jesus. Um, uh, just to let you know, I feel way, way, way more comfortable right now than I did about four hours ago, uh, because four hours ago I had three pages of notes and nothing to say. That's not fun. Uh, so it, it sounds like, as people affirm some things after the first and second services, that the Holy Spirit, what you're going to hear is the result of a miracle of God. Um, and, if, and if you're blessed, that's good. If not, maybe I'm walking in the flesh again. I'm not sure. But we'll, we'll try to walk through this text and find out what Jesus wants us to know about his arrival in your life and my life as he arrived in Jerusalem those thousands of 2,000 years ago. So let's share together. This is Luke 19, 28 to 44, and then we'll go back through it a, a piece at a time and find some things out we pray. Uh, after Jesus had said this, what he had done, he had to talked to the people. He was speaking. He gave a parable, and it says, after he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Beth, uh, Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, 
Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? Uh, they replied, the Lord needs it. Uh, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. Uh, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. Uh, when he came near uh, the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd uh, of disciples uh, began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Uh, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if, you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As, as he, amen. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and then hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Might there be a blessing for us in the reading and hearing and proclaiming of God's word today. I want to encourage you, uh, not only is this account in, in Luke as we're looking, Matthew records it, Mark records it, and John, and each of them give a little different perspective. It might be uh, fun for you and good for you to, to look at that today. One part I like about Matthew, it says this, when Jesus arrives, the whole, the whole city um, was disturbed in one version of the Bible. It was stirred in, in another version of the Bible. In other words, when Jesus came, something happened. And so we want to look at what the something happening is here as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. The reason he's coming there, it's the time of the Passover, uh, recognizing the Jewish people looking at their past, looking at their exodus from Egypt, looking at the plagues that took place and how the freedoms they have, and, and uh, that's their gathering. And there's all kind of folks that are gathering here. Jesus is at the uh, end of his three-year ministry where he's been teaching, where he's been preaching, where he's been healing, where he's been restoring, uh, where he's, he's brought people uh, to understand the forgiveness that they can have and, and the hope that they have. He's also told them on numbers of occasions what's going to happen in these days ahead in which we're looking at, the again, the Easter account um, this week, and he foretold that numerous times. And so we see this great gathering and people waving palm branches and laying them on the ground. We see cloaks being put on the ground, um, and we see people shouting. Now, it's interesting here that, that, again, Luke, he doesn't say the word Hosanna. Other gospels share that word. So you, you get them all together, you get the detail. It's interesting what each guy uh, thought was crucial for him to write, and, and we put that full story together. So today, what I'd like to do is just to go through this just a little bit and, and see if there aren't some things we can glean um, truth from God's Word. So the first part, part of this is about these disciples. And they're with him, uh, and, and Jesus, said these praise and all this neat things are going with these palm branches and, and cloaks, and, and, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and all of these things. Now, the disciples are with him, many of them for three years, and they're sort of basking in the glow of this, I would imagine. They're, you know, when people are, are honoring Jesus and all that, I, I wonder if any of them thought, well, hey, I'm with him, you know. We, we like to be with people that are being uh, honored and all that and say, oh, that's my so-and-so, that's my uncle, that's my friend, that's my whoever. And so they're basking in that. But that, that's sort of a cool thing. But there's something happens here that I think, to me, is like makes obedience sometimes hard. And, and what we have here is Jesus calls two of them over. All this stuff's going on, and he calls two of them over. Okay, and the, the people are gathering, and, and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and get that cold in town there. I said, he, like, you'll find it. It's there, and just, just bring it back to me. Um, doesn't seem to tell him why. And, and he says, oh, by the way, when you get there, if somebody says, why are you taking this cold, tell them the Lord needs them. And that's all he gives them. And, and they do it. They do it. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, let me give you an example. 
All right, right now I look at you st- sitting here and I go, hey, here's what I'd like you to do. This afternoon we have this activity going on, and, and you know what? We're going to use a dump truck, believe it or not. So I want you to go into Quarryville. There's a dump truck on 3rd Street. I want you to go get it for me. And I want you to bring it, bring it back. And, and, oh, and by the way, if anybody comes out and says, hey, why are you taking my dump truck? Just tell them, well, Pastor Blake wants it. Wow, big deal, right? Woo, well, that's a big deal, huh? Think about that for a minute. Okay, and then you go do it, and when you get there, a guy comes out, and, and, and he says, hey, why are you taking my dump truck? And, and you say, Pastor Blake wants it. And he goes, oh, okay. And he gets back in the house. But wait a minute. Sometimes obedience takes us way out of our comfort zone and things that, that, that aren't easy. Wait a minute. Turn this thing around. Turn this thing around again. You're back in Quarryville, and just when you go to, to step up, don't, for the ladies, let's, let's, let's make it just a van or something. We, we need a vehicle, right? just whatever it is. And you're ready to step in, and the cop comes down. And now, you may not know that he knows or whatever, and he's looking and going, what are you, what are you doing? I, just think about that. So anyway, here's the point. Sometimes Jesus may take us out of a place of comfort, and when we're obedient, there's great blessing in that. When we're, when we're obedient, there's great blessing in it. Think about this now. Okay, so Jesus is now on this colt. Now remember, they went in town, brought this colt back. Now, now they come by, and, and it's Hosanna in the highest. Blessed you comes in the name of the Lord. And there's, there's palm branches and their cloaks and all that. And, and this guy goes, hey, that's my colt. How cool is that? And think about this. Forever and a day, that colt's going to be talked about because of Jesus riding in on Jerusalem. And what about a blessing of that? Wait a minute. Let's go a little further with that. So these people come. There's, there's difficulty in obedience. But then we see these followers come. And they've seen and they've heard things, and they're praising Jesus, and there's expressions towards Jesus by word and actions. And Jesus is getting the royal treatment, the hero's welcome um, that we have here. And then they start cutting branches, which, you know, I don't know whose palm trees these are, but, but he, they're cutting branches and putting them down. That's one thing. But I want you to recognize something else. Then they start taking their cloaks and laying them in front so this coat can, they're laying down their cloaks so this colt can walk over them. And maybe it's to settle the dust. Maybe it's in homage to Jesus. I pray that's what it's about. But wait a minute. They're, they're throwing down their cloaks. And, and some of you might now, right now, want to go to me, but Blake, what's the big deal? The big deal is they're throwing down, they're laying down their cloaks. Third Street. I lived on Third Street. I was in one of the row. We, Lisa and I lived in one of the row houses in 23 East Third. And, and, and in our one bedroom, there was a closet about this big. How many remember the old houses that had closets about this big? But, but on the wall, some of those old houses, see, young people, you, 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 you just won't get this. But, but anyway, these old houses, all they had was a strip of wood and some pegs on it. How many remember did any of you ever live in a house like that, huh? And, and so the deal is, why were the closets so small? And why was there a, just a pegboard, if you will, across there? Because that's all the outfits, people, that's all the room they needed. That, that was it. That's all they had. And, and so there wasn't that need for that. You, you know, today we have one, two, three, four, five, six pair of shoes, I realize, ladies, I'm stopping way short right there. I, I know that, okay? Uh, maybe you guys too, but, I, I, but anyway, but it's way different. My mom growing up, 1931 to th- 1940, when she's just a little girl and everything, you know what? She had two pair of shoes, her everyday shoes and her Sunday go to meeting shoes. And so it wasn't nearly that much. And, and well, why am I talking about that? Well, let's turn the clock back 2,000 years ago. Do you know what a cloak meant to those people of that day? It was their outfit. They would have an undergarment, not like we call undergarments today, but that was important as well. But remember what Jesus said? If someone asked for your shirt, this is Blake trans- translation, if they asked for a shirt, give them your cloak, give them your coat as well. 
Whoa, that was huge. For people to hear that and go, what do you mean? I'm not giving my cloak. That's the most important thing. Of their earthly possessions, that may have been the most important thing they owned. And these people are taking it and laying it so a colt, a donkey's colt, can walk over it. That is huge, people. So, what are we going to lay before the Lord? What are we going to lay down? Are we willing to lay our garments down and say, the thing that's most valuable to us, the thing that is most precious, that we hang on to the most, are we willing to lay that under the feet of Jesus and, and to give that to him? That's really a question we have. I believe one of the biggest things that we have to lay down is our self-will, by the way. In other words, what I want to do, when I want to do it, and this is how I'm going to live my life. This is what I'm about. And when we say to Jesus, not only are you my Savior, not only have you given me heaven, which I can't imagine anybody that does not want to have eternal life in a perfect place called heaven. But when we make him Lord, then we lay down everything and we say, Lord, this most valuable thing, my decisions, my self-will, my possessions, my every, I lay at your feet. I lay under your feet. And I think as we see that, these people, their worship this day, this was extravagant worship of Jesus. You know what? I don't know whose palm branches they are, but I know the cloak was the person. You wouldn't throw somebody, well, you might want to, but they wouldn't let you have it. Somebody else's cloak, you wouldn't, but you would lay your own down. Are we willing to lay that which is most important to us? And this is a form of worship and, and, and praise to God Almighty that, that we would lay down that which is so important to us. Third thing, when we find Jesus arriving, when Jesus arrives, there's going to be a call to obe obedience. There's going to be a place where you and I need to make a decision of laying things down when he arrives and making a decision about accepting and receiving what he has. In the middle of that, though, too, we have to recognize when Jesus arrives, there's going to be opposition in your life and my life about who Jesus is. Um, there are people that are going to say, I don't want to hear that Jesus stuff. Now, how do we know that? Well, let's look at what the uh, Pharisees said. So the, the crowd's going crazy, wonderful, worshiping Jesus. And it says this, some Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now, what they're telling him to rebuke them about is the praise that they're giving to him. And, and they're, they're not happy about this. We don't like when our adversary receives accolades. We, we, we don't like that. You, we and our humanists just don't like that. When, when somebody else, I don't care, sorry, if the New England Patriots ever win another Super Bowl. I love you, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Nate loves them. But, but, and you know what? Because our adversary, we, we, they don't need any more accolades. So these guys are saying they're envious, they're jealous, and they're saying, tell the, tell the people to be quiet. And Jesus says, well, you know what? If we do that, the rocks are going to cry out. Wow. People of God, we do not want the rocks to cry out around West, Wesley Church, do we? We, we want to be the ones praising God. Um, some people have this sense of, of too much Jesus and too much worship and too much praise. And uh, I, I recently talked to a woman, and she's adamant against the things of the Lord, the things that I believe in and so forth. She, she, uh, she, she's harsh about it, and, and she even said about uh, compared Jesus to Santa Claus. It's just some story, just some. And, and there was that that edge about it of opposition. Um, and I think there's opposition, my opinion, and I think if we find script, I can find scripture to help, help out with this, that people um, are, are adversarial towards Jesus because of the conviction of their sin and the brokenness of their lives. And we don't like to feel that way and have to acknowledge that we need something more than ourselves. And you know, when I said about laying down, you know, our own self-interest and everything, that, that makes so there's opposition to that as well. Um, that conviction that comes and, and the fact that people want to call their own shots. It's very interesting to watch. Even though the, the shots they've called have not been good for their lives, they still want to call 
their own shots. I know, I think it was just a couple months ago I shared this story, and I shared it about 10 years ago, but I had a teacher friend of mine come up to me at school one day, and for some reason one talked faith, one, you know, about things, and, and we got into this a little bit about church, and asked about Wesley, and back in the day, and it might have even been 20 years ago, but anyway, then he started to tell me about what he did in his church and how he worked in the inner city and, and had served in missions things. And, and I, I was like, good, that's awesome and great. And then for some reason he stopped and he looked at me and he said, but Blake, I don't ever want to go to church where all you hear is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I looked at him, I sort of had one of the Blake sheepish grins on my face and, and, and I said, well, then I, I don't think you ever want to come to Wesley. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well... We believe Jesus is all that. We, we preach Jesus, Jesus, Jesus kind of thing. Um, and, but there's opposition to that. Even, think about that. This was a good church guy, but he didn't want to hear Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Man, I imagine maybe the rocks cry out at that house. I'm, I'm not sure. But there's going to be hostility. Fourth thing I want to share with you today is Jesus enters uh, Jews. He's coming. Uh, he's clearing the Mount of Olives, and he's coming and looking down upon the city. And as he sees the city, we pick it up. When Jesus arrives, there's tears, and they're his tears. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Just to make sure I'm not alone. How many of you this week had tears in some form or fashion? Anybody in this here have that? Yeah, we have tears. Sometimes, how many of you have experienced this? The tears of joy. When, when, when they put a newborn on your belly right after he arrives or she arrives or, 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 or puts, puts them in your arm. How, how many of you know those tears from that child? Oh, man. Oh, goodness. Or, or maybe it's a time when someone's been away or somebody's been separated and that you see them and pandemic or not, you hug them and you rejoice in that and there's great tears. Those weren't Jesus' tears right here, but he had those moments as well. How about this? The, the, how many of you have ever been so embarrassed with what you did you ran off and had tears about? Like, oh, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. And you were so embarrassed you had tears about it. Or maybe you had tears because of fear. Like, whatever that was, just the fear that you might have. Or quite honestly, as often happens, we have tears because we grieve. I knew Ryan Smith, the basketball player from Lampeter Strasburg and East Strasburg. I knew him about this much. His great uncle is my brother-in-law. But I want to tell you, when I, when I was reading the articles about Ryan, I'm, I feel it already. I just went out in my driveway and I, whew. Here's a 21-year-old young man who left us way too early, um, in our view, um, with leukemia. And, and Ryan loved Jesus. And we can think of all the reasons what God could have done with Ryan being here. And, and, and it's hard. And we have tears and we grieve. And you all know about grief. You all know about losing people. But there's another kind of grief that Jesus' tears were right here. And we see it as we read it. We grieve for the heartache that our loved ones and those around us go through because if they had only known. And there's, there's sadness about that. There's, there's sadness. It's a lot like grieving. The, but we grieve what could have been. You know, some of the saddest words we ever hear or say or hear ourselves say is, if only I had known. If I would have known now or then what I know now. If I would have known then what I know now, I wouldn't have Whatever it is, fill in the blank. And there's a grieving that, that comes from that. And see, Jesus, that's what he's saying here. If they would have known, if they would have received it, if they wouldn't have rejected the kingdom of God is near, repent, be baptized, turn. And he looks over the city, two and a half million people that have not repented, have not turned, led by religious leaders that are hostile towards it. There's a great sadness over sin. And, and there's a heartfelt sadness about what might have been and the failure to, to repent and to come to Jesus. 
See, some people may have said, though, you know what? They got what they deserve. They got what they deserve. It's their own fault. They have no one to blame but themselves. Well, that might all be true, but that's not Jesus' attitude. You know what Jesus' attitude is? Heartfelt brokenness for the lostness of the people. And I know some of you in this room, you've experienced that, whether it's about your parents whether it's about your children, whether it's about your brothers and sisters, you have such a hurt in your heart because you know what brings you peace. You know who brings you peace, and you desire so much for them to experience Jesus in some form or fashion the way you've experienced the presence of Jesus. Amen? How many of you have cried over your children? You've cried over your brothers and sisters. You've cried over your friends because they continue to turn their hearts against the Lord or away from Him and want nothing to do. Jesus, when He arrives, though, He brings compassion. And then He brings some truth to this, obviously, as well. As we look at He says this, if only you had known, and that, that's a sad place. Friend of mine growing up, Alan, it was still my friend, Alan Eschbach. Alan and I, we lived next door to them from the time I was three till I was, I was 10 years old. And his dad, Everett, um, uh, he used to have this expression. He said, you can't put an old man's head on a young man's shoulders. Think about that for a minute. You can't put an old man's head on a young man's shoulders. There's times I, I look at my journey and go, you know what? If I would know, have known then what I know now, I wouldn't have. But I got to be honest with you, my feet are still feet of clay, and I still have flesh. I still need the Holy Spirit to hold me in the place to walk in faithfulness and obedience because I wonder if I went back to that place if I wouldn't just do the same dumb things that I did before. I'm just talking about me here, and I'm just questioning, but some of you are nodding, so maybe you, you're wondering the same thing. Would we do that? How many of us have looked as, as Jesus brings the truth? If I had asked, if I'd have said, if I'd have prayed, if I'd have, if I'd have, if I'd have, what would bring you peace? If they would know what brings you peace. Here's the wonderful thing about believers. When Jesus arrived in your life, here's the peace that you got. You got peace with Almighty God. You have forgiveness of sins. When God looks at us, when we stand before him someday and Jesus stands with us, what's our only excuse? We have none other than Jesus. Your son is my savior. He is my Lord, and he has washed away and has made me worthy to stand before you now. That's a prompt. That's the peace that we have with Almighty God. And then, of course, then we can have peace within as we look inside our own hearts and our own lives and realize the forgiveness, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter what we've said, no matter what we've failed to do, however horrendous we think our, our sins are, we can still have peace that Jesus has taken care of those places for you and for me. And that's the truth that he's given um, to these here. And finally, there's a peace that we have on the journey with other people where we don't have to be in a place of resentment and harshness. So, so as we see the truth of what Jesus is speaking here, he says, what gives you peace? It's a relationship with me. That's what gives. If, if you've not made Jesus your savior and he wants to arrive in your life today, he wants to, he wants to bring you peace. So when he arrives, what does he do for us? Well, there's a a couple things some I've alluded to already. One, he banishes guilt. Jesus is amazing at banishing our guilt. We may in our heads not be able to forget incidences where we walked outside God's will, and some of those had really horrible effects and, and, and consequences. We may not be able to forget it here, but what happens when Jesus arrives in our lives, we forget it here. That, that it no longer, uh, we're not guilt-ridden and burdened. Big difference between Jesus arriving and Satan arriving. When Jesus arrives in your life and my life, he banishes guilt where uh, Satan inflicts guilt. Jesus brings conviction. And here's the big difference, and I I'm probably shared this with you before. Guilt. Guilt is what paralyzes people from being all that Jesus has for them to empower us. Guilt keeps us in a place where we go, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm terrible. I've done these things. And guilt keeps us. It even keeps us from going down aisle six in a grocery store because the person we've offended and feel guilty about is at the other end. 
It paralyzes us. Guilt paralyzes. Conviction motivates us to repent, to restore, and, and to return to a journey with him. So he banishes. Jesus' arrival banishes guilt. It also, the, the arrival of Jesus can banish bad habits, remove bad habits from your life and my life as well. What, what's that look like? Man, when Jesus arrives, there are things where he works and takes off our edges, and he's not done with us until the day of Christ Jesus. That, that, that's a process. But there are certain things that immediately, immediately, Jesus has oftentimes in people's lives have taken that away from them. Um, last week in the blog, I shared these three things. He cancels our past when Jesus arrived. God bless you. When Jesus arrives, he cancels our past, he conquers our problems, and he can change our flaws. Um, some of you know this, that the day I got saved, the day I got saved, there's three things absolutely changed in my life. One was foul language and, and filthy talk. That, that, that left me immediately. My temper left me immediately. And the third thing, I have never, ever, 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 even in any kind of jest or fun, read a horoscope out of the newspaper. And some of you might go, What's the big deal? It's not of God. I'm just going to be honest and direct with you. It's, all, it's some people writing about what's going to happen in my life. I know what's going to happen in my life. Someday, I'm going to stop sucking air. I'm going to lay down. My eyes are going to close, and I'm going to be in the presence of Almighty God. That's what's going to happen in my life. And, and so, those of you that may still joke and read about that, that we'll let the Holy Spirit work with you on that. But I'm just telling you that those things in my, because see, I think I put some solace in that, something in that. I put something that was accountable in that um, reading of that. And, and I used to, here's what I used to do. 10th grade, beginning 11th grade, I'd go in the library, first thing in the morning, get the newspaper. I'd read the sports. I'd check the sports. And then I'd check my horoscope. And when I went to school on Monday, uh, April the 20th, it was, no, April the 29th, I went and I read the newspaper. And for whatever reason, I was a newbie. I was a new Christian for all of about 12 to 24 hours. I just couldn't turn the page to look at it. I'm just, that's a bonus. This wasn't ever in my notes here. I just want to tell you that. That's a bonus. But Jesus wants to replace our bad, remove our bad habits and, and replace them with his peace where fear we once had. Again, this whole dying thing, uh, I, I imagine in a group like this, most of you in here are like me. We don't have a fear about what's going to happen to us when we die. We just don't have that fear. Now, I have a little bit of question about the method by which I go. You know, that... that I'm just being honest with you. But when Jesus arrives, he suddenly changed that. Now, by the way, you can't put an old man's head on a young man's shoulders. When I was 30 years old and a believer and all that, I don't think I looked at it quite the same. But it's 64 years old. Oh, I just look at it so differently. Like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to check out at some point. But I'm going to be in the presence of Almighty God. By the way, at my departure, I would like it to be like this, where I just go to bed, go to sleep, and... Wake up in heaven. How, how, how many like that story? How many like that one? All right. I will tell you, there's good news. My grandmom did exactly that. My pap, on the other hand, he looked at his family around him in the living room, my mom and my grandmother, and said, in the fall leaves wither and die, in the spring new life, he laid back, put his feet up, and left. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Wow. That's why we were like, whoa. You know what had happened? See, Jesus arrived in my grandfather's life a long, long time ago, and he replaced any fear with peace. But for today, for today, there's two things that I also believe when Jesus arrives in your life and my life that he does. He can take away bitterness and give us kindness. He takes away bitterness. Bitterness of those who mistreated us and those who were harsh and, and, and the bitter and, and the agony of, of our past but also the bitterness of our present, and he brings kindness. When Jesus rides into our lives, you know what he does? He dissolves judgment and turns it into compassion. He dissolves judgment. This week I had our old buddy Chris Lenhart, uh, Pastor Chris Lenhart, um, uh, at Calvary Monument Church. I had the opportunity to have breakfast with him a day, and, and, and he, he had a sentence that he said a long time ago that I 
have put to memory and and um and I got to see him and talk about all these things and that and and here's one of the things he said. He said people do not need us to analyze their lives as much as often they need us simply to care. They don't need us to analyze their lives. They need us to care. Notice it doesn't say enable It doesn't say give them everything, but simply to care. Most people that are in a bad way, they don't need us to analyze it because they already know they're in a bad way. They already know that they've put themselves in that. They oftentimes know that, you know what, if I knew then what I know now, they, they get all that. But they've been overcome by bitterness and resentment and heartache and, and all of those things. And for whatever reason, did they do it to themselves? Really good chance. They have no one to blame but themselves? Probably. They probably, though, already know that. And they don't need us to analyze that. Now, We might have to go back and walk them through those painful difficulties and dig those and dredge those out and get them to a place where they can get rid of those things. That might have to happen. But they don't need us to analyze and bring judgment about those things. Am I making any sense to you here? There's people outside these walls that want nothing to do with Jesus because when they were younger, when they were, they were in churches that were judgmental, they were in churches that were self-righteous, and, and uh, they, they, they were put upon that they either weren't good enough or they weren't worthy or, or whatever, or they were doing this, this, and this. Um, let, let me stop. Brothers and sisters, please, if you're reading your horoscope, I ser- I'm, I'm serious here. I don't want you to think I'm coming with judgment from this pulpit right now. He took that from my life, and I believe that was good for me. I don't want you to think there's judgment. I would invite you to just check God's word. That's all I'm asking. But I don't want you to think, oh, well, what a terrible Christian. They read your horoscope. Again, I don't want want a weenie boy either. It's real. You know, I don't want to back up. Did I just say that? (laughs) I don't want you to think I'm a wimp. I I want to tell you, but, but, but... but there's churches that if you don't do this and this and this, well, then you're, you're, see the door. No, no. They don't need us to analyze. They need us to have compassion and care. And that's what happens when Jesus rides in. Watch this. How many of you have some folks in your life, life that may be unsavory? They might be foul. They, they might be crude. They might be lost in things of this world and all that. But you just love them and you just can't get beyond it. How many have people like that? That's because Jesus has ridden into your life. He's arrived in your life. And he's given you compassion for those. We don't want to condone. We don't want to condone sin. But we don't want to condemn people. Amen? Because Jesus, he didn't do that. Anyway, I need to close. There's no more notes. No more notes on my hand. I'm down to the bottom. So, Father, we do come before you. And we're thankful, Lord Jesus, that you've arrived into our lives, that you've met us here, that you've allowed us to sense your very presence. Lord, we want to be obedient, even when we're fearful that we'll look ridiculous, Lord. Lord, we throw down our cloaks the most important and most valued things that we have, we put them at your feet. Lord, we put them under your feet. Lord, we recognize there's going to be hostility towards you, and if they were hostile towards you, they'll be hostile towards us. We pray that you would give us peace, that we might be peace to someone else. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for the truth, and we pray that anything I said today that's not truth that you would take from these dear people's hearts and minds, but anything that is true and real and right and the absolute truth, that they might receive that as it was intended this day. Lord Jesus, would you transform us? Would you allow us to be more like who you are because you have arrived into our heart and our lives? And may those around us sense the compassion that you had for us and compassion in their lives that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Just sing this chorus together. Jesus.
Jesus Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer. you to pray with one another you know, uh, spouses or family or whatever and just to pray with each other and, and, and go before the Lord and pray out loud like there'll be prayer pockets all over the place um, I realize that you may be here with no one so I, I, I'm going to ask um, that, that Lisa um, if you'd come up here and, and Tanya for, for any of the ladies that you happen to be here alone and, and those two ladies will pray with you right here and, and Pastor Rich, if you come with me, um, and we'll just stand over here in case there's some guys here that are alone, and, and we want to pray with you and everybody else, if you have somebody there, just that you'd pray with one another, whatever the Lord lays on your heart um, about that. Um, so, um, um, I, I, Lisa, I'll pray with, with you one-on-one -on -one later, okay? I bet you two will do the same. So. so, if you would turn, and if you need to turn chairs, fine. If you're with with whoever you're with and so forth. And, and if you're a guy, you're here and, and just we'd ask you to come and join Pastor Rich and I here. And, and, and then, uh, Rich, if you want to come over here, we'll do guy's side over here and, and gal's there. Would you pray? Would you go before the Lord? This is Pete, one of our dangerous disciples.
Um, again, uh, last week we shared, people shared that uh, Jesus, they said their name, they said, Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is my Lord. And typically we do that about twice uh, a year. But, but I thought today, again, we, we ought to do that because maybe some of you left it last week and you thought, oh, I, I really should have proclaimed Jesus as my Savior and Jesus as my Lord. So I'm going to give you an opportunity right now if you just like to say your name and that Jesus is, if we forget what to say, it's Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is my Lord. So is there anyone here who'd like to publicly profess that in front of this gathering this morning? Anybody? Well, we got a whole row. Go ahead. Go ahead. Laura, okay. I'm Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. One, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. I'm Gary. Jesus is my Savior. Amen. All right. That's a hot row right there, boy, I tell you. When you're last week, I'm Alan. Jesus is my Savior. He's my Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Anyone else this morning? Yes. And here you are. All right. That's David, by the way. All right. You didn't hold back this week. Anybody else before we go? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Now, we're going to do some dance uh, practice here. Craig, we're going to do it on this side over here. And we're going to, we could use some help in taking out the first five or six rows as we prep for some really expressive worship tomorrow night. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day.